And good to see everyone this evening. We are studying uh, great themes of the Bible. Some of these are of great interest to people because uh, they've not done a lot of study on it. This, I think, tonight will be one of those, if the Lord wills, next to Wednesday night will cover Satan. I suspect that'll be of interest uh, to some. Yeah, forgive me, I've got a cough drop in my mouth. Um, um, allergies have decided it's time to come around. So uh, I'm doing the best I can do. Okay, angels. Uh, first of all, let's begin with the idea that angels are God's ministering servants. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14, you may remember that the writer of Hebrews is demonstrating that Jesus is superior, or if you prefer the word, he's better. Either one, either one works. And here, he says in reference to the angels, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? But please note, angels are not sovereign, but serve the king for the benefit of his subjects. Okay, sovereign, it just means like the king. Or a queen, in the case of England right now, that'd be the, she would be the sovereign that they have. Uh, God is the sovereign over all the universe. And as such, he makes sure that his people, members of the kingdom, or citizens of the kingdom, are taken care of, at least according to Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14. Now, I already know what somebody's thinking, or will think, and that is... Uh, do we have guardian angels? As members of the church, do we have guardian angels? And I've got a perfect answer. I don't know. So uh, now you know. Uh, they do have other jobs or a part of their jobs in minist as ministering servants. We've seen this before in our Sunday morning study in Luke chapter 16, verse 22 which is the story of the rich man and Lazarus. You remember that Lazarus died and the angels carried his soul to paradise. So here's a job they have. Does that mean uh, that when you or I die as members of the church that angels will bear our souls to paradise? Well, it might. It did in that case. It's a possibility. Now, do I know that for certain? No. I don't know that for certain either. So I'm giving you the information I have and, uh, and letting you draw your own conclusions on some of these things, or at least uh, think about it on your own. In Matthew chapter 18, verse 6, we learn something about the role of these ministering servants in reference to, again, the people of God. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Now pause a minute. Notice one of these little ones who believe in me. He's not talking about children, not in the physical sense. He may be talking about babes in Christ. That, that would be an agreeable possibility but a babe in Christ could be any age. It just depends on when they learned the gospel, when they obeyed it. Uh, what he says is, don't, you know, you're in trouble if you cause them to stumble. Then he goes on, picking up in verse 10, listen to it. Take heed that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I say to you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them goes astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine and go to the mountains and seek the one that is straying? And if he should find it, assuredly I say to you, he rejoices more over that sheep than over the ninety-nine that did not go astray. Even so, it is not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Again, within this context, we've already seen the little ones are new converts, babes in Christ. That's who we're talking about. We're talking about children in the sense of the physical family, that kind of children, not at all. Uh, but, but please observe that he says their angels are always in front of the face of the Father. Now, 
what, is, what all does that mean? Well, I don't know everything that that means. I'm going to keep telling you that. Uh, their angels, is that all of God's people's angels? Or is that specific angels assigned to specific people? I don't know the answer. Here's what I do know. Angels were created. In Colossians chapter 1, verses 16 and 17... Paul says, for by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist. Now here's my question. Are angels a part of all things? And I think the obvious answer is, well, of course they are. They're part of all things. Were they created? Apparently they were. Now, when were they created? I don't have the answer to that. I would, in the creation, that, that seems logical, but at what point in time? He doesn't really specify, like a day or something, that that might have happened on. In the book of Job, chapter 38, notice what he says beginning... In verse 4, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me, if you have understanding. Now, this is, by the way, God asking questions of Job. Job has spent a number of chapters, whenever he gets the chance to speak, saying, I wish I could sit down and have a discussion with God. I wish I had an umpire, or we call it a mediator, to stand between me and God. Well, God comes, (laughs) and God says, first, I've got some questions for you. And he has begun that, and this is a part of it. Who has determined its measurement? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? To what were its foundations fastened? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Or in that text, sons of God is the angels. They shouted for joy, but... At what point were they created so they could do that? I don't know. I cannot answer that. I just know they were created because all things were created by Jesus, who is above all things, and in him all things consist. How many angels are there? Uh, You know, we're real fond. Uh, In fact, I've I've never been in a church anywhere, a congregation, that didn't, I think it's important to take the count. How many people are here? Well, how many, how many angels are there? Uh, the answer is found in Daniel chapter 7, verse 10, where Daniel says, A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated. And the books were opened. Ten thousand times, uh, times ten thousand stood before him. Now, is this hyperbole? It might be. Uh, that, that would not totally surprise me. Hyperbole just means exaggeration for emphasis. Uh, but what I can tell you is though I may not know an exact number, I don't think I can nail that down, that they are, they're vast in their numbers. There, there are enough angels to do the bidding of God. Whatever he's done, he's got angels to send on that mission. Now, I want you to bear that in mind, because later in our study, we're going to come to the study of Jesus Christ. And when you think about him coming to earth, you, you've got to realize that he gave up the possibility of commanding these angels to do what he wanted them to do. Now, he does talk about uh, if he prays to the Father that his Father could send. He talks about that. But while he walks the earth, it does not appear that Jesus is able to do that. Hebrews chapter 12 uh, contrasts the uh, law of Moses and Mount uh, Sinai with the the law of Christ at Mount Zion. As he goes through that, among other things, he says this in verse 22 of Hebrews 12. 
But you've come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels. How many are there? Well, the inspired penman says you can't count them. That's how many there are. You cannot count them. So what do we know about angels so far? Well, they're God's ministering servants. They were created, and there are vast multitudes of them. And let's learn a little bit more about them, some of their characteristics that Scripture reveals to us. For example, angels are, generally speaking, invisible. Uh, look at Numbers chapter 22. Numbers chapter 22, you all are familiar with this story. It in, it's the story of Balaam's donkey. And as you go through that story, you'll notice that Balaam is unable to see the angel. Uh, so every time that Balaam starts to urge his animal forward, his donkey forward, uh, the donkey turns or ultimately just drops right underneath him. Why? Because he could see what, what uh, Balaam could not see. So notice one case. Numbers 22, verse 31. Then the Lord opened Balaam's eyes, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his drawn sword in his hand, and he bowed his head and fell flat on his face. So the donkey could see what, what Balaam could not see, the invisible angel. Look at another one. In 2 Kings chapter 6, well, we've got the, uh, the Syrians coming along. Uh, they are determined to wipe out God's people. And Elisha, of course, is the prophet at this particular point in time, Elijah having ascended to heaven by now. But what, what happens when the, when, these, uh, when the Syrian forces come along? Pick up at verse 15 of uh, 2 Kings chapter a six. And when the servant of the man of God rose early and went out, there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. And his servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? So he answered, Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Now we're back somewhat to the innumerable company, aren't we? But listen to the next verse. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray open his eyes that he may see. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. So what ends up happening to the Syrians? Well, suffice it to say, they lose. <laughs> uh, they lose in a rather interesting way, and I'm... But, that's not really the purpose of our story tonight, except to observe the angels. And what do you know about them? They're not visible to the average man. They, we can't see them. Could there be, and I, what, be very, very careful here. The very idea that I use the word could means that I don't, I don't know the answer. But could there be an angel in this auditorium at this time? And the answer is, well, there could be, because we couldn't see him if he was here. Now, I did use the male uh, pronoun. You notice that? There's not an angel listed in Scripture that is ever delineated as anything other than a male. However, they're not males like we are. Because, uh, as we'll see later, they, they don't have... Uh, uh, gender, you know, in, sec in, the, in the same way that we do. They do not uh, uh, procreate in the same way that human beings do. Now, when they do appear, they appear in a form that is suited to God's purpose. So we just read uh, about the case of Elisha and his servant. What form did the angels appear in when the man saw him, when the servant saw him, them? And the answer is, well, they were, they were with chariots of fire. Uh, that's the appearance that they took on on that occasion. Is that the only appearance in Scripture? No, not at all. 
In the book of Mark, chapter 16, verse 5, <clears throat> we're in chapter one of the chapters where Jesus has been raised from the dead. And after his resurrection, you may remember that the women go to the tomb. And when they go to the tomb, what do they find? Well, notice verse 5 of Mark 16. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a long white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. A young man in a white robe. How did he appear this time? Well, not as a chariot of fire. Appeared as a man in a white robe, a young man in a white robe. That's how they appeared on that occasion. What about Acts chapter 1? Acts chapter 1, of course, is uh, where... Uh, Jesus is about to ascend into heaven and then does ascend. And when that happens, we find uh, another case of angels being involved in what goes on. So let's, let's just go ahead and pick up in verse 4. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said... You have heard from me. Now, what promise had Jesus made that they heard from him? Well, there are two promises. I think this one refers to the another comforter. From we're looking at John chapters 14, 15, and 16. And the word another is very interesting in and of itself because it is literally translated to be another of the same kind. In other words, Jesus was God come down to earth, so what will, the, what will this promise to the Father be? Well, it's going to be the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> when the Holy Spirit comes to earth, uh, he will be walking the earth like Jesus did in a sense of the word. He'll be working on the earth. Uh, with those people. So that's, that's what he's talking about there. For John truly baptized with water, but you should be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Who's going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit? Well, the apostles are going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Will anybody else ever be baptized with the Holy Spirit? We're going to talk more about that when we get to the study of the Holy Spirit. Uh, but yes, one other case does this take place. It's in Acts 10. It's so unique that Peter could say the Spirit fell on them as it did on us at the beginning. So which means it's never happened since then. And it was very easy to identify what took place. So the promise of the Father ultimately is they're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Therefore, when they come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Any of you in here that might on occasions be teachers, whether you're teaching your own children or you're teaching somebody else's children, I want to notice something. Jesus walked to these men for three years, and they still didn't get it. Why do you think teachers keep repeating things? It's because you've got to keep repeating it until people get it, until they learn it. That's why. Jesus has repeated over and over again what the nature of the kingdom is. They didn't get it. It's going to take the coming of the Holy Spirit for them to get it. So they're, they're waiting for that. They're in, they're in uh, Jerusalem and, and the, or in the area around. They're on the mount. Now, when he had spoken these things while they watched, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. So again, 
what kind of form can angels take? Well, I know one form they can take, and that is they can take the form of men. Two men in this case, one man in the case we already looked at. They can also take the form of, of, uh, of chariots of fire. That's, that's, you know, that's beyond my comprehension. It's someone that has a, that has a character and a nature, you know, uh, and is a created being, could look like a chariot of fire. That's, that's just amazing, you know, to me. Uh, but that's what we, can, what we do know. There are some things that angels are not permitted to do. Now, let's take an example. Matthew chapter 22. This is when the Sadducees came to Jesus. And when they came to him, they thought they had the perfect trap. Now, my expectation when I get to heaven is that I'm going to find out that they had used this trap many times with the Pharisees, and it worked. And the reason it worked is because they didn't know the power of God thoroughly enough, and they didn't, they didn't appreciate exactly the nature of everything. So they threw out this story. You've heard it. Uh, there was a woman who married a man who had six brothers. He died with no children. And so the next brother married her, and his one of his goals is to have a child that can carry on the name of his brother. Well, guess what? He died, no children. And so the third brother married her, and the fourth, and the fifth, and the sixth, and the seventh. And then the Sadducees said they all died, and then the woman died. And then their big question, which I think they probably had trapped the, the Pharisees with, who will she be married to in the resurrection? And that's where Jesus begins to explain very clearly. We're going to pick up at verse 29. Jesus answered and said to them, You are mistaken, not knowing the Scriptures, nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like the angels of God in heaven. Okay, let's pause just a minute. And what do we learn? Uh, they, don't, they don't marry, nor are they given in marriage. Why? Because they're like the angels. We will not be married in heaven. That doesn't mean I won't recognize Teresa, uh, because truth be known, uh, if you look at it, the, the rich man knew Lazarus. The rich man was in, in torments. But he still recognized Lazarus in Abraham's bosom. He recognized who he was. And he wanted him to go take care of some things. First of all, get him some water. That When he couldn't do that, he wanted him to go help his brothers. So, will we know each other in heaven? I think the obvious answer is yes, we will know each other. But will we be married to one another? No. No matter how many years you're married on earth, you won't be married in heaven. Because we'll be like the angels. They don't marry, they're not given in marriage. That's what it says. Now, by the way, that answer actually diffuses a whole different issue. People who are reading the early chapters of Genesis notice that the sons of God married the daughters of men. And they'll say, see there, sons of God, that's the angels. Well, sometimes it is. I've already shown you that. Try to be as honest and open as I can be. But in this case, I know they're not angels. Why? Because they marry the daughters of men, and angels don't get married. So who are the sons of God? Well, to be the son of someone is to partake of the nature of. And we Christians are called sons of God. You look at places like Romans chapter 8, you see that very clearly. And so uh, it appears to me that what we have there is that men who would love God and were dedicated to him got married to women who were worldly-minded, and what did it end up? It ended up that everybody became wicked, except for Noah and his family. That's, that's what it ended up. Now, that's a side issue, but I thought, you know, you can write all that down if you want, or you can ask me later, and we'll go back over it. But th those are things that I've seen within Scripture. Now, I don't want to leave their problem totally suspended 
Notice he said, you don't know the scriptures. What scriptures did the Sadducees rely upon? They relied upon the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Those were their books. Well, Jesus is a savvy teacher. If they only rely on those five books, then Jesus says, I'm going to quote from one of your books. I'm going to show you don't know scripture. And he does do that. When he goes on to say, verse 31 of Matthew 22, but concerning the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was spoken to you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. I am. Do you notice that Jesus is making an argument from Scripture based on the tense of one verb? I am. That's present tense, right? Can God be the God of someone who is dead? If you take the Sadducee view, that is, when you die, you're dead all over like the old dog rover. And the answer is no, that won't work. That will not work. And that's what Jesus is demonstrating there. What have we learned then about angels? Well, we have learned they cannot marry. Let's learn something else. Turn to the book of Revelation, if you would. And I know what's on your page there, but I want to go first in chapter 19. Re Revelation chapter 19. Or maybe I added that to your paper. I didn't add it to mine, except by hand. <clears throat> Here is John. He's being uh, somewhat escorted by an angel. And here's what we find in verse 10 of Revelation 19. And I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, See that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. I skip over to chapter 22, where you get almost the same uh, thing that is, is related there. At Revelation 22 I want to read verses 8 and 9 uh, of Revelation 22. Now I, John, saw and heard these things. And when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel who showed me these things. Then he said to me, See that you do not do that, for I am your fellow servant and of your brethren the prophets, and of those who keep the words of this book, worship God. So what can angels not do? They cannot receive worship. Now next week when we talk about Satan, I think you're going to find a, a little uh, addition to what we're talking about here. That is, part of Satan's problem, it appears to me, is that he wanted uh, to receive worship. Number three, angels cannot be mediators. So look at 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. Do you not remember? Oh, wait a minute, I skipped. I went to Thessalonians. I apologize. 1 Timothy 2, 5. For there's one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. I don't know if it's happened to anybody else here. I have no idea. Uh, a, few, a couple of weeks ago, we received this big envelope in the mail. Uh, I looked at the return address. I had no earthly idea who we're talking about. When we opened it up, they had sent me a rosary, a very specific rosary, a rosary that's supposed to be dedicated to Mary, the mother of our Lord. And they wanted me to begin to pray using that rosary. That would have been interesting since I don't know the rosary. Uh, but beyond that, they were hoping I'd send them money so they could buy more people rosaries. Uh, but their reasoning was this. Mary has done some powerful things in the history of the world. Really. Would you name one of them? They tried to name some, uh, but uh, none of them were biblically established, established, and 
I would say she doesn't do it. Why not? Because she cannot be a mediator for you or me before the throne of God. She can't do it. Nobody else can either, except Jesus. Jesus is the only mediator, so angels cannot mediate. People that pray to angels are making a mistake. They can't do anything for you. Not in that regard. Now, God may use them to do things for us, but the prayer goes to God. God's the one that sends the angels out. Not, not the angels tell God what, the way he ought to do it. It doesn't work that way. And then look at 1 Peter chapter 1. One more thing that I know for sure angels cannot do or could not do. This is back in the Old Testament times. <clears throat> Peter's talking about the revelation of the will of God and the mystery of salvation, which was not made known. And as he's talking, he's talking about it, let's just pick up uh, verse 10 of 1 Peter chapter 1. Of this salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched carefully, who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, who was in them, was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. To them, it was revealed that, not to themselves, but to us, they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit, sent from heaven, things which angels desire to look into. What do the angels want to know in the Old Testament? They want to know, God, how are you going to save man? Could they know it? Not in Old Testament times. Once it was revealed by the Holy Spirit, they could know it. But no more than we can know it, because it's revealed for all of us. So these are things angels cannot do. Anybody have any questions? I feel like I'm pushing through. I want to try to get finished with all this stuff on angels, but I don't want to pass somebody's questions over. Okay, what are some of the things angels do do? Or, and the answer to that comes, for example, Luke chapter 2, verse 14. You remember, here the angels are singing, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, good will toward men. So what are they doing? They're glorifying God. Revelation chapter 5, verses 11 and 12. Here's John writing again. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders. And the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. What are they doing? Praising God. What can angels do? They can praise God. I might add, by the way, that's something we can do. And not just can, we ought to. We ought to be praising God. What else do they do? Well, they protect the righteous. Now, look at Psalm chapter 91, verses 11 and 12. Now, significantly, this passage is one of the ones that the devil quoted to Jesus. You may remember in the temptation, as it is reported in uh, uh, Matthew chapter 4, here's what the passage says. For he, that is God, shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. Now, by the way, who was the psalm originally written about? The devil applies it to Jesus. But who is it originally written about? And the answer is it's written about the Israelites in general. It was Jesus an Israelite when he came to earth. The answer is yes, he was. Does this passage apply to Jesus? The answer to that also is yes. Now, here's the thing. The passage applies to Jesus, but the devil's trying to stretch it beyond what it goes. He's trying to make it go further than it really goes, and that's where the real problem comes. And so what do we know? They, they protect God's righteous. Jesus was certainly one of those. 
Psalm 34, verse 7, the angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear him and delivers them. <clears throat> now, here's what I wonder. In Philippians chapter 4, you may remember verses 6 and 7, that the apostle Paul says, be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. The word translated keep there could be translated modern-day English with the word guard. It guards our hearts. Is it possible that God helps guard our hearts through the agency of angels? And my answer to that would be, well, it's pos it is possible. Is that the way he does it? I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> uh, I'm, if you've not noticed already, I'm going to let, let you in know, a secret. This whole lesson, what I've been trying to do is show you that there are things that we know and we can state with certainty. There are other things that we don't know and we must always indicate just that. I don't know. I've got some ideas. Here they are. But your ideas may be as good as mine. And I hope you can see that. Angels will be active in judgment. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, beginning verse 7, <clears throat> The Apostle Paul writes to a church that is deeply disturbed. They're disturbed because uh, in the first book, it appears that they had thought, well, if a Christian dies before Jesus comes back, they're going to miss out on heaven, on the resurrection in heaven. And so Paul came along in the first book, and he said, no, no, no. He said, in fact, the dead in Christ will rise first. They'll be raised first. Unfortunately, by the time you get to the second book, which, by the way, was not written very, very much later, it appears that they'd come to an improper conclusion. Everybody's going to be raised, and we're going to have to go spend eternity with those people who have been tormenting us. Well, gee, Paul is answering that problem when he says, and to give you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So in the second coming, angels will be active. And they'll be active particularly, in some ways, as regards the judgment. Look at Matthew chapter 13. In Matthew 13, Jesus tells a parable of the tares... And as he tells that parable, Matthew 13, pick up at verse 36, as he explains the parable. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house. And his disciples came to him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. He answered and said to them, He who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. Now, by the way, that would be Jesus, of course. And he goes on, the field is the world. Please notice that. Not the church, the world. There's a difference. The field is the world. Well, he goes ahead. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the, this age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and those who practice lawlessness, and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their Father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Will the angels play a role in the resurrection? The answer is yes. Will they play a role in the judgment? Absolutely. They're going to be the ones at the bidding, at the directions, excuse me, of Jesus. They're going to be the ones that separate, you know, good from bad and in the harvest time. Look at Revelation uh, chapter 7. 
where we learn that angels also have a place in eternity. Verse, pick up verse 9. After these things, I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. I right, go on down, begin at verse uh, or continue there, and notice uh, what, what are they going to do? They stood around the throne, the angels, four living creatures, fell on their faces uh, before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and honor and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. And by the way, I think that I, I probably gave you the wrong verses there. It's in chapter 7. You need to bust those apart. I made a mistake there. And then, Matthew 25, 41, what does it tell us? Then he will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Will angels be there in eternity? The answer is yes. Some of them will praise God and praise Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Others of them will be cast into the lake of fire, and they will spend their time there. One word of comfort, not exactly about angels. God didn't make hell for men. I didn't say no man will go. I said God didn't make it for men. God's intention was that the devil and his angels would be destroyed in the fire. And destroyed is a, uh, it's, it doesn't mean annihilated, but instead they will continually suffer in the fire. <clears throat> Unfortunately, some men live so as to receive the same judgment as those, as those angels do. Any quick questions on angels? Next week, Satan, okay, so... Okay, well, we'll, Lord willing, we'll come back next week and talk about Satan.